Hello, my name is Dr. Andrea Hamry, and I'm the Director of Policy and Research here at the Eno Center for Transportation, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank that shapes public debate on multimodal transportation issues. If you're interested in learning more about Eno and supporting our work, please consider visiting our website, making a donation, and becoming a member today. A recording of this webinar will be available on the Eno website and emailed to all registrants. Make sure to sign up for our email list to receive Eno Transportation Weekly, webinar announcements, report releases, and to learn about our renowned professional development programs. Today, we welcome you to the latest in our series of webinars. We're going to think about ideas and learn about the way that professional thinking shapes transportation systems. I am delighted to welcome our esteemed guest presenter, Dr. Susan Handy, who is a distinguished professor in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at the University of California, Davis, and the director of the National Center for Sustainable Transportation. Her career has spanned over 30 years, and she has made major contributions to academic research on travel behavior and the built environment, as well as bicycling. She was recently honored with the Transportation Research Board's Thomas B. Dean Distinguished Lectureship, and she is the author of Shifting Gears Toward a New Way of Thinking About Transportation, available now from the MIT Press, which truly serves as a masterclass on transportation policy, planning, and engineering ideas and issues. Her work on Shifting Gears is the subject of our webinar today. As an academic luminary and thought leader, we are honored to welcome you today, Dr. Handy, to the Eno Center for Transportation's webinar series, and we look forward to learning from you and sharing a few questions with you after your presentation. Attendees, please share your questions in the Q&A box, and I will curate them to share with Dr. Handy. And now let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Andy, and thanks to the Eno Foundation for this opportunity to be here with you all today and share some of my thinking about transportation. Uh, I'm coming to you from California, which of course is famous for our freeway system. We have lots of freeways, we have lots of drivers, we have lots of cars and trucks, and all of that adds up to a lot of driving measured as vehicle miles of travel. Um, that's a concern because all of that driving um, threatens sustainability in all its respects, whether we're talking about pollution or safety or equity. California has been especially um, concerned about um, the contribution of transportation to our climate um, problem and for a couple of decades now has been working to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We've set very ambitious goals for reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Well, because passenger transportation makes up 30% um, of our emissions, um, there has been a lot of focus on what we can do uh, to reduce emissions in this sector. So the state has set um, very ambitious goals also for, for converting to electric vehicles. Um, we've set one of the most ambitious targets uh, in the world for achieving 100% of um, new car sales as zero emission vehicles by 2035. But all of our analysis shows that um, that's not gonna be enough, um, that to meet our targets for greenhouse gas emission reductions, uh, we are also gonna have to reduce how much uh, we are all driving. So the state has set goals for VMT reduction for uh, the metropolitan areas of the state and now requires our metropolitan planning organizations to adopt what's called a sustainable community strategy along with their regional um, transportation plans that are required under federal policy. Um, What's interesting is that if you look in these plans, um, there is uh, still quite a lot of freeway expansion uh, being proposed, including a rather controversial project um, that runs through my town of Davis, um, between Davis and Sacramento that you see there off in the distance. Um, so that raises a really interesting and important question. Why is California widening freeways at the same time that it is trying to reduce driving? 
this sort of cognitive dissonance, as I think of it, where a new approach to transportation coexists with the traditional approach, uh, can be seen not just in California, but really throughout the country at this um, moment in time. Um, which makes it a very interesting transportation moment. All across the country, you can find places where we're pouring uh, billions of dollars into highway capacity, but you can also find places where we're pouring billions of dollars into transit and other alternatives. And you can find places where both things are happening at the same time. So I find this all very interesting and um, what I do in my book is sort of step back and look behind um, these different approaches to transportation and take a look at um, the ideas that underlie these different approaches. So my thesis about this moment in time is that the ideas embraced by the transportation profession at any moment in time shape the transportation system in fundamental ways that to understand um, the kind of system that we're building, we have to understand that way of thinking. Um, and what's interesting about what's going on right now is that the ideas that have traditionally dominated the profession over the last century seem to be shifting toward a new way of thinking that could lead to a very different kind of transportation system. So said another way, um, it's professional thinking that shapes the transportation system. Professional thinking made up of a set of core ideas uh, influences the practices, tools, and guidelines that shape our policies and decisions that then shape the transportation system. And if that's right, then to change the system, we have to change our thinking. So what I'd like to do is share uh, a bit about my thinking about these sets of ideas that uh, have dominated the profession and now seem to be shifting. But uh, I should first say just a few words about um, what I mean by the transportation profession. And of course, the boundaries of this can be very fuzzy, um, but with my focus on the roadway system primarily, uh, I would say that the transportation profession clearly includes federal, state, regional, and local agencies, the employees of those agencies, as well as the consultants they hire, the professional associations to which they belong, uh, plus us academics. I consider myself a part of the profession um, as well. So if you look below the surface of what we've been doing for the, the last century, um, you'll find a set of core ideas um, that really explain what it is that we've been doing. These are not the only important ideas, um, but I think these are some of the, the really important ideas um, that explain both the good and the bad of our system. If you add these ideas up, um, you get a focus in the profession on the goal of making it easier to drive. And this is essentially what we've been doing for the last century. These ideas are very much embedded in professional practice. Um, if you look at uh, key documents that guide the work of the profession, like the Highway Capacity Manual, the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, a policy on geometric design of highways and streets, otherwise known as the Green Book, um, you will very much see these ideas embedded in these documents. But what's interesting is that the latest editions of these books um, look a little different from the previous editions. Um, suggesting, again, that maybe there's some shift in these core ideas. So for each one of these um, traditional ideas that I focus on, um, you, can, uh, you can see an alternative idea um, that is gaining traction in the profession. And I want to point out that none of these alternative ideas are entirely new. Um, they've been around for nearly as long as the traditional ideas. But what is new is their um, growing acceptance within the profession 
and their growing influence on the decisions we make about the transportation system. And what these ideas add up to is the goal of making it easier and safer to not drive. So what I'd like to do now is take a look at not all of these ideas, because we don't have that much time, but at least um, a few of these ideas um, and some of the ways they've influenced what we do in the profession, uh, but also some of the ways um, that they are now shifting. So uh, since I started with the um, uh, with the point about highway capacity expansion, uh, why don't we start there? And here the idea is that it is the job of the transportation professional uh, to provide enough capacity in the form of freeway lanes to ac accommodate all um, possible demand. Um, I would argue that this is what we've been doing for the last century. Um, this idea is very much evident in the predict and, and provide approach um, that has dominated transportation planning, where we use our travel demand forecasting models um, to show where there's going to be congestion in the future. And then that's where we, um, we provide additional highway capacity. Well, of course, this approach um, largely ignores the uh, phenomenon of induced travel, uh, whereby capacity expansion leads to an increase in um, driving volume rather than a decrease in congestion. Uh, as it turns out, this phenomenon was recognized um, by professionals uh, as early as the 1920s. Um, so we, we, we've known for a long time that this goes on, yet um, that knowledge has, has never had much influence on the decisions that we make about the transportation system. By now, we have um, lots of robust research that documents this phenomenon um, and suggests that the elasticity is on the order of one, meaning that a 10% increase in highway capacity will, in a period of five or six years, lead to roughly a 10% increase in vehicle miles of travel, meaning that we are accommodating a lot more driving, but we haven't um, done much to address the congestion problem. So my colleagues and I took this evidence and um, used that to build what's called the induced travel calculator, um, which has now been blessed by Caltrans as a way to estimate the increase in vehicle miles of travel that a freeway expansion will generate. Um, as a part of the environmental review process under the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, we've been uh, working with the state on this for the past several years, and I have to say it's been a very interesting process uh, in that there's a lot of pushback from the professionals um, over this phenomenon and, and, and what the impact um, of highway building will be. So a lot of traditional thinking um, still out there, but um, there are some signs of change. Uh, we had one freeway actually canceled in California, a, a freeway that had been uh, in the plans for decades and a decision was made that this was not the right thing to do. Um, there are a lot of um, cities around the country that are rethinking existing freeways and considering in fact, taking them out uh, with help from some federal funding. And then I think one of the, the um, most interesting signs of change um, is the shift to the idea that maybe rather than adding capacity, what we need to be doing is thinking about managing demand instead and doing that in a, in a more serious way than we have in the past um, through pricing. So it looks like as of June, um, we will have congestion pricing in Manhattan, the first time we've had this um, in the US. All right, now, of course, all of that capacity uh, is capacity for vehicles. Um, so this is another idea I wanna say a little bit about. Um, we measure capacity with respect to vehicle throughput. Um, we design spaces for vehicles much of our work is focused on the needs of vehicles. Well, one of the problems here is that our vehicles are getting bigger. 
Um, not only are Americans buying more SUVs and pickups, um, but all the models of our vehicles are getting bigger. And of course, that is uh, a significant c concern from the standpoint of safety, uh, but it also means our vehicles are taking up a lot more space. Um, uh, cars are not an especially space efficient way uh, to move people. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen the version of this meme before, um, but this is an opportunity cost that we're using all of this land for cars rather than for people. So here's where some shift in thinking is evident. Um, for example, the idea of um, road diets and complete streets, where we think about how can we use that very valuable public resource um, that is our street space um, for purposes other than simply moving and storing vehicles. Uh, the pandemic certainly uh, pushed us to think about how we use our streets um, in different ways and the, the value of that public space. And maybe again, it's better, better used for things other than just vehicles. Um, and then we have research too that shows the economic, um, well, economic downsides of using all that space for cars and the economic upsides of using it uh, in different ways. I think one of the biggest signs of a shift in thinking in transportation may be the shift in thinking about parking how we're moving away from our traditional practice of parking minimums, which have contributed to an overabundance of, of parking, um, to uh, doing away with those minimums and maybe even setting maximums on, on parking. Um, and, you know, it's nice to think about how we could use all of that space um, for people rather than um, for, for parking cars. Um, so, of course, why we are adding highway capacity for vehicles is so that um, we can increase mobility uh, defined as the ease of movement. So much of our efforts are directed toward the goal of, of mobility. And the corollary to this, of course, is that congestion is bad. So, uh, of course, congestion is bad. <laughs> None of us like congestion. We don't like being stuck in traffic. Um, there are lots of um, costs to uh, congestion. So we, we measure congestion uh, as level of service, uh, as a function of the volume to capacity of the roadway system. And then um, so many of our decisions are based on what are the implications for um, level of service. And of course, what we have traditionally done is focus on the capacity part of the equation, hence the, the, the widening of highways as a way to reduce con congestion. But is mobility really the right goal to be focused on? Well, people like Lewis Mumford as early as the 1950s argued that no, it's, it's really not that transportation is simply a means to an end. And really what we should as a profession be focusing on is the goal of accessibility, of making it easy for people to get to um, the places um, they need to get to and do the things they need to do. So the, the current, um, currently popular idea of a 15 minute city, I think is a very nice way to explain this concept of accessibility. And it's a pretty simple but powerful idea that if we had more of the things that we need on a daily basis within close proximity to home, um, then uh, you know we'd have less need for travel. And in fact, congestion would become um, less less relevant to our lives. So the, the concept of accessibility has, has gotten quite popular, at least in transportation planning circles. Um, I would say it's, it's um, um, maybe not has had as much impact on 
uh, what we actually do, as might be suggested by the, the interest in the concept itself. And that's in part because we are, are still um, working to develop um, easy, uh, easy accessibility measures, um, ways that agencies can, can measure accessibility and incorporate that into their planning processes. And um, a lot, there's a lot of work going on on this, um, but the part of the challenge is that we don't have the, the kind of standardized ways of measuring accessibility, um, like our standardized way of measuring congestion uh, as level of service. So uh, I think one, one more thing that may be helping a push to, um, to an accessibility way of thinking um, is some loosening of the hold that LOS has on the profession. So for example, in California, um, at least for the purposes of environmental review uh, for transportation projects, as well as development projects, we've moved away from a focus on level of service and instead a focus on um, vehicle miles of travel as really the key environmental impact of the decisions that we make. Okay, so uh, shifting our thinking on capacity on vehicles and mobility also requires some shift in thinking about speed, uh, because that's why um, you know we, we're so unhappy with congestion is because uh, it slows us down. So speed, well, you know, humans like the thrill of speed. Um, as a profession, we define speed as efficiency. A lot of our planning is directed towards minimizing um, travel times. But of course, speed has um, some negative implications as well, particularly for safety. Um, speed is um, not good, um, whether we're talking about uh, drivers within vehicles, uh, but especially if we're talking about people outside of vehicles, the faster that cars are going, um, the more risk there is um, for injuries and fatalities. So we, um, we try and control speed. We encourage speed on one hand, but we also try to control it. We control it through speed limits. Um, we use this um, funky 85th percentile rule where we set the speed limit at the speed at which 85% of drivers are going. Um, that speed or less, which in essence means that um, drivers are setting the speed limits themselves. How fast drivers are going determines how fast drivers are allowed to go. Well, some communities have decided that um, maybe instead we should think about how fast we want drivers to go and then set speed limits accordingly. So we see a lot of these 20 is plenty um, movements around the country. The problem is that um, it's hard to get people to go slower if we've designed roads for people to go fast. So um, the concept of design speed is very important here. Um, the idea that we should be designing roads um, for as high a speed as practical to, to attain a desired degree of safety so what we end up doing is designing straight roads with wide lanes and, and clear zones, which help to reduce the risk of crashing, um, but which also increase, um, tend to increase speeds. So um, to, uh, to make up for some of those design um, flaws we have in our system, we then do things like traffic calming and use various kinds of techniques um, to try and make up for those design flaws and slow the traffic down to create better environments for um, bicycles and pedestrians. But even a more radical idea would be to start thinking that, you know what, maybe slow is good. And again, here, I think the pandemic really helped us to maybe think about this possibility. Um, the slow streets movements uh, in lots of cities are helping us think about, you know, maybe we don't have to get everywhere quite so quickly and that there's some advantage to traveling more slowly. 
Uh, that picture on the right, um, those are two of my former students who just happened to run into each other on the train between um, Sacramento and San Francisco. So of course they had to take a selfie and send it to me. Uh, but the point I wanna make is that that, um, that slower means of travel, which actually isn't that much slower than driving, um, you know, has some upsides too. Uh, and this never would have happened if they had been um, in their cars. So maybe, maybe slow can be good. And maybe that's something we need to think about. But of course, um, if we start talking about slow is good, um, that and slowing people down, that starts to bump up against this very core idea uh, of freedom. Um, we love the freedom of the open road. Um, it's a cliche, but it's also the truth. Cars give us the freedom to go where we want, when we want. Um, they can be life and death, as in the case of evacuations from wildfires and, and other events. Um, so yes, cars are very much um, an element of this idea of freedom. Um, but that, uh, that ignores also the fact that cars are also a very much a burden. Um, cars are very expensive and getting more expensive all the time. Um, not everyone has access to a car. So what sort of freedom do they have with the transportation system we've given them? Um, a surprisingly high share of people who can't really afford cars own them anyway, uh, because this is really the only way to make their lives work. So 25% um, of households with incomes under $25,000 um, don't own a car. Uh, meaning that 75% do own a car at considerable financial burden. And this focus on cars as freedom, I also worry that this, um, uh, this distracts us from the larger problem that not everyone in this country has equal freedom, freedom of movement, whether by car or by other means. In the US, black and brown people are far more likely to be stopped and cited as drivers, but also as pedestrians and bicyclists. Uh, women are very much restricted and constrained in their movements by very real concerns over personal security. Um, this is also true for members of the LGBTQ community. And so perhaps we need a much broader way to think about freedom and transportation. And I particularly like um, this idea of mobility justice as articulated by the untokening collective um, that puts the focus on options, uh, the options available to marginalized communities, but also the role they play in shaping um, the options that they do have, uh, as well as rectifying the harms that have come from the priority that we have given to cars over the last century. And then one more idea um, that I wanna say something about is um, the idea of technology. Uh, where here the idea is that technology can be a solution to all of our problems without us having to give up our freedom, um, that we can have our cake and eat it too. Um, the profession has long put it's faith in technology as a way to solve our transportation problems. Um, the public likes this idea too, that we can have our cake and eat it too, um, that we don't have to change our, our behavior. Um, but this, this idea also needs um, some close uh, examination. So there's a lot to be said here, um, but you know, I'll just point out our, our current um, big question, um, Technology has been important for addressing lots of our transportation problems, air quality, safety, electric vehicles are now gonna be a part of our, our, um, our environmental solution. Uh, but sometimes new technologies can cause new problems at the same time that they are solving um, the old ones. So we need to think really carefully um, about, about technology and what we wanna do with it. <laughs> How do we want to implement these type of technologies? What problems are they gonna solve? And how can we avoid creating new ones? 
So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's up to us when we think about um, future mobility. Uh, it's not deterministic. We should be deciding if and how we want to make use of it. So, you know, we can, um, we can go driverless or we can go driverless, right? There are different ways to think about these things. So to wrap up, um, I think there's, there's good evidence of shifting ideas in the profession. Um, some of these ideas have shifted more than others. Um, some have shifted more robustly um, than others. Uh, and a question I ask myself is, um, is the shift enough that we could, can really think of this as a paradigm shift in um, transportation planning? Uh, where the old way was all about making it easier to drive um, versus a new way where we focus on making it easier to not drive. So I would like to think, yes, maybe we are at a tipping point, um, uh, but I've actually been using this slide for at least a decade. So I, um, I am not always so confident that we're really at that um, tipping point. And if I, if I were to map out um, the acceptance, level, acceptance levels of both the traditional way of thinking and the alternative way of thinking, uh, it might look like this very unscientifically, that the traditional ideas um, you know, came on very quickly and were quickly embedded in the transportation profession and how the profession went about its business. Um, the alternative ideas, as I said, have been around for a long time. It's just that their acceptance level um, has been much lower, but yet is now um, creeping up. Um, but what you'll see in my little depiction here is that the traditional ideas um, have not necessarily dropped off very much at the same time that the alternative ideas uh, are gaining in acceptance. And so I, I characterize the current approach really as a throw everything at it mentality uh, where it is congestion. And what we're doing is continuing to invest in highways under the belief um, that that's gonna help with the congestion problem at the same time that we're, we're investing in alternatives um, to driving, uh, sometimes in a very big way. And my concern is that um, by doing both at the same time, we are not giving the alternatives uh, a fair chance that these approaches are working against each other. So uh, I'd like to propose that the profession um, do some deep thinking about transportation and the ideas uh, at the core of the profession. I hope this talk has helped to encourage um, those of you out there to do some of that. And I look forward to hearing your thinking. Thank you very much. Uh, what what a tremendous uh, overview um, of your thinking and your work on uh, so many complex issues. Um, we we are uh, really really grateful to be able to learn with you today. Um, a lot of questions have poured in, and I am going to um, share uh, um, the first uh, question from mine. And uh, thank you, uh, Xavier. Uh, this will blend in your question as well. Um, over the course of uh, your career, of my career as well, things like um, safety, environmental protection have become um, increasingly politicized. Um, sustainable transportation projects we can often see get caught up in, in culture wars rhetoric, things like the war on cars. Um, uh, Fifteen-minute cities are, are perhaps one of the, one of those examples that um, um, that you touched on. Um, Xavier uh, asked about, you know, would moving more planning and kind of engineering professionals kind of um, into um, political spheres um, perhaps uh, be a helpful contribution? And, and, um, and I think my question is partly, you know, sort of, are, are you hopeful that your work on shifting gears could um, sort of help us find more common ground, perhaps kind of lower some of those um, rhetorical temperatures? Well, yeah, the, the politics of it all, um, very discouraging that it 
it has spilled over um, so much into this realm. Transportation used to be um, something that there, there was more consensus about um, right or wrong. Um, so solving that problem is above my my pay grade. Um, <laughs> but I think, well, I guess what I would argue is that there are a lot of win-wins out there, right? I mean, I, you know, wouldn't we all be better off if we could do what we need to do without having to drive so much, right? So again, I think it's it's, it's going to some of the, the core ideas and the core thinking about transportation. Car is freedom. Well, yes, that's true, but it's also it is also a huge burden. And I think everybody can think about the ways that cars um, are also problematic to their lives at the same time that they're, they're helping their lives. So, um, so I think, you know, focusing on the win-wins, nobody's talking about getting rid of everybody's cars. It's really about providing alternatives and expanding options, which again is something I think is kind of a, a, a a basic core important idea in this country is having options, having freedom of choice. Um, and I think, you know, money talks, right? If, if we can make the argument that um, a system that's less dependent on the car can also be a more affordable system, not just for us as individuals, but for us as a society. Um, that that may be a, a convincing sort of argument. I mean, you think about all the billions we're investing in highway expansions with the goal of reducing congestion when we pretty well know that that doesn't work, right? So is that is that a good use of public public resources? Thanks. Yeah, there's been some some great kind of um, calculating estimates, sort of how, what are we building ourselves into in terms of the um, the sort of dollars and cents there? What are we committing ourselves to? Yep. Mm -hmm. And are are we taking in enough revenue to pay pay for it? Um, Wonderful, thank you. Um, uh, more great questions. Mar Marina, uh, Marina's question speaks to the issue of public involvement. Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, so often those who who rely and um, sometimes are um, don't have access to a private vehicle and really need to use transit or walk or, and bike in their communities. Um, for, for a variety of reasons, often have less input on the plans and projects. Um, and she, she asked, you know, is, is there a, a way we could Im, Im improve public involvement? Or do you think that there's um, things in terms of public involvement that might help with some of the, um, some of what you're sharing about shifting professional thinking? Could we better harness um, the public? And, I, and some of your writing has talked about um, the thinking among um, planners, engineers, and then how that's in in kind of dialogue with the public's uh, understanding of some of these issues. Yeah, I mean, obviously, public input is so important to this that you know the public should have the right to help shape its transportation system. Um, but that's kind of a two-edged sword because a lot of the push, for example, for continuing to expand the highway system comes from the public um, who doesn't like congestion and believes that highway widenings will, will help to address the congestion problem. Um, and then that spills over to influence on the um, our, our policy makers, because they're hearing from the public that, you know, we need highways. And then we get, you know, my congressman saying, look, uh, you know, I, I got us all this funding for this highway expansion that's going to address the congestion problem. So, um, so the public has a really important role here to play. And we need to make sure that the public that is, um, you know, the, the voices that are not being heard are being heard more than they are. But also, um, you know, there's, I think, uh, there's some education to be done as well um, and some shifting of thinking in the public, in the minds of the public, along with the profession. 
Wonderful. Thank you. I'm thinking of the uh, the wonderful series, uh, survey series from um, out of the Mineta Transportation Institute on, uh, that has showed some kind of evolving thinking uh, among the public on um, sort of gas tax issues and revenue and um, longstanding, yeah. I think over at least a dozen years now, um, that's been a uh, really important um, a source for sort of for, for sort of understanding some of the public thinking on some of these issues. Um, wonderful. And it, it, if mm -hmm. I can just add yes. briefly to that, um, you know, work by um, Kelsey Ralph and her colleagues, she's at um, Rutgers on, you know, professional attitudes and beliefs in the public. And then Amy Lee, my former student, who's now a postdoc at UCLA, just completed a fabulous dissertation on this question of why is California continuing to build highways? So if this is a question you're, you're interested in, uh, I, I suggest you Google that. You'll find that pretty easily. Wonderful, thank you. And shout out to uh, Xavier Harmony, his uh, his new dissertation on some of um, these issues, uh, just uh, just wrapping up this semester on, um, on on this intersection with the public and political spheres. Uh, thanks, um, Xavier, for your question. Um, what ad what advice might you have for um, perhaps you know especially students or early career professionals, but really really any um, sort of leaders in their communities um, uh, who are listening today want want to perhaps you know offer more choices, help? Um, Donald Shoup uh, recently wrote, uh, "We can't change the past, but we can we can be a part of changing the future." Any um, any any thoughts uh, that you want to share with? Um, with those who are, are, are interested in um, supporting more sustainable transportation in America? Well, I, I think I go back to my point that we're, we're not likely to do things differently um, unless we start thinking differently. So, so ask questions like, why are we doing it the way we're doing it? What are the underlying beliefs and assumptions that ex explain that approach? Ask the question, you know, how can we do it differently? What if we try this rather than that? And I think it, you know, it does take some some questioning of the, these basic ideas about. Well, I'm obsessed with the congestion obsession right now because I feel like that is driving so much of what we do. So I think you know some some new perspective on congestion. Maybe we should just stop worrying about it so much. It's kind of a fact of life in urban centers. It always has been. It always will be. And so, you know, we're, we're focusing on maybe on the wrong problem if we're, if we, if we maintain this, this obsession. So I think some, some questioning of, of really those underlying ideas and beliefs and assumptions that, that drive the choices that are being made is really really important. And of course, we academics, those of us who are um, teaching the transportation professionals, we have a really big role to play in doing some of that challenging of traditional thinking. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes, you, uh, that uh, makes me think of um, Peter Norton's wonderful work at the University of Virginia. I think he's he's shared, you know, uh, really that idea of are, are we asking the right questions and that can really kind of um, impact our trajectories. So what a wonderful um, thought to keep us keep us thinking uh, as we move forward and, and to wrap up with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Handy, for generously sharing time with us today and uh, helping us reflect more deeply on ideas and shifting gears. Um, thank you everyone for attending this webinar. Uh, we hope you will join us for our next webinar on March 12th, where Dr. Phil Plotch will be um, hosting four senior transportation innovation officers about how uh, they are overcoming obstacles to make dramatic changes at their agencies. We hope you can join us then. Um, thank you all very much for your time and support.